I think what you guys did in season four, I think you even upped it from season three. So uh, thank you guys for taking the time to talk to me. And I, I know, thanks a lot. Wow. We... <laughs> and I forgot, congratulations. Congratulations on the nomination. That's wonderful. Very, very, very well deserved. Um, it's a big surprise. Probably because like you said, like season three had been so shot out of the cannon and one less angel was such a like part of this season that we thought, well, this mm -hmm. year people don't like our stuff was more seamlessly woven into the, mm -hmm. the show. So we disappeared a little into the background seemingly a little. So it was so lovely to, for them to nominate us and notice. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I mean, I think the um I think the the praise for Maisel is is very constant when it comes to uh you know the craft stuff like it's unmatched in my opinion i think it is like a comedic um level of madmen of how good the crafts are in this show and i think the music actually is up there with that so i think that's why people respond to the music so much um and I guess that sort of leads me to my first question is we talked a lot last season about like authenticity. I think I revealed that I didn't even realize that the music you guys wrote was original music. Um, I guess I, in a general sense, what can you tell me that you guys learned about um, baking in authenticity in terms of like what it was like for season three and then what was it like going into season four? Well, I think it, what it was, you know, one step even more in season four, Tom sort of alluded to that a minute ago, you know, season three, we wrote specifically for Shy Baldwin and a couple of his backup uh, mm -hmm. group, you know, and that was great. We got to really dive into that world and work in such a space that was so authentic. This year, Amy Sherman Palladino gave us such ridiculously funny curveballs of, you know, we, we did a lot more this season than we did the previous season, just in scope. You know, not only did we write a Shy Baldwin song, um, City Lights, but we wrote a song for, you know, Harry Belafonte, but, you know, which is, we had such a blast and that was a really challenging uh, assignment. But then on top of that, we were also asked to write all these burlesque songs, you know, that played yeah. in the burlesque house. And we were asked to write cues for, you know, uh, we, we wrote a, a we wrote the one good song from a really terrible musical, you know, that was a really fun <laughs> assignment. So we had a lot of really fun out, out of the, you know, out of left field assignments this year that, where I think above and beyond and allowed us to, in a weird way, like blend even more into the fabric of what makes Maisel Maisel from different angles. You know, we got to work mm -hmm. in that, in the burlesque house, we got to work in the Broadway house, we got to work. So all these other moments we could really have a, a show our musical voice and, and really collaborate with the, with the designs and the writer and the writers on it. That, that was, I think to us, um, the step up um, from season three and and partly what made us I think really um, even step up our own game a little bit because we we're like oh gosh we're, we're we're all we're coming at it from so many different angles this year and it was a it was a real joy to do that yeah I think that also it was like what we learned is to trust ourselves as writers and to just to envelop ourselves in the world because it is about world building it's it's cool mm -hmm. that you mentioned that it's it's about the fact that you want, unlike sometimes uh, when people write songs for, for TV, it's like the pizzazz moment that everyone notices like, oh, there's that song they put in. We want you to think that's just part of the world. We want you to feel like, if you stop and go like, oh, some new writers probably wrote this, then we've failed miserably. Like we, we want it to just be part of the world. So just like the costumes and just like the set, it should feel a part of the Maisel world and never take you out. Um, and so, I think this year we had to be more like, I'm gonna be dorky, but I was, I went to acting school when I first started in college and it's sort of like going method. We had to like, <laughs> we, had to, we had to sort of just dive in and be like, okay, today we are going to be like burlesque composers. And you have to sort of like let yourself go into that world and then just believe. Mm -hmm. And then it was like an actor having to like the next day I'm playing a different character. Okay, today we're, uh, you know, we're- oh, okay. uh, the, the, where the, the person who worked at the Catskills and loves Rodgers and Hammerstein, but he's not that great a writer, what would he write? And so you put yourself into it like an actor does. Yeah. So that's how we kind of play. That has to be so tough because I will imagine with the burlesque stuff, I actually thought, again, sort of like what I admitted last time, that I thought that was 
like a music supervision thing. I didn't realize that it was, I was like, oh, it sounds like something that I know, but I don't know what it is. And I, I this is exactly what I did in season three. I like shazammed it when I was watching it. For, like, <laughs> when I was what watching it for like the fourth time. And then I was like, nothing's coming up. Nothing's coming up. And then I, was, and then I realized later, I was like, oh, Miser Moore wrote the music even for the burlesque. <laughs> I wish that, oh, you know, I, I, I wish they'd release those tracks. They're so fun. You know, that those are, mm -hmm. I think, you know, writing those, those tracks, we had such a blast. You know, Tom mm -hmm. and I are normally songwriters, but we treated that as songwriting because, you know, mm -hmm. uh, it, we were, each time we got an assignment to write a burlesque song, there's a whole story behind it. You know, obviously there's bubbles in the bathtub and then there's the window washer doing her window washing routine, yes. but which was hilarious. And Great. we got to kind of just track all that, <laughs> put all that together. And what the fun, the fun of it is that even, even, in, even though there's no singing in those songs, a lot of times Tom would still write lyrics just because it just, it just gave the song a story. It, it kind of, and also made us kind of giggle in the background. As we put all this very together. dirty, dirty lyrics that no one should ever hear. And yes, my God. Get them out of me. There has to be like a new release, like Maisel After Dark. Exactly. Like. Maisel, after, Maisel After Dark is already Maisel After Dark. But yes, <laughs> there needs to be Maisel After Dawn, where they were. The <laughs> also, is that, you know, we would sometimes get exactly like that, like uh, it's going to be the window washer. And Curtis and I get to have, got to have fun, like, creating some of the gags. We would pitch them gags by saying, oh, well, oh. we're gonna put in a sound of like something falling. And mm -hmm. then they're gonna hear us go, hey, well, who's up there? And they, we would pitch those jokes to them by putting them in the tracks. And some of those ended up being part of the routines, which is just, you know, it's such a blast. And, and all in working with Marguerite Derricks who's a choreographer and she's uh -huh. just such a joy to work with. She's really fun. She's like, I mean, like all of us have to be, she's super fast. But she's just she she gets exactly what you're doing, and she'll she'll play around with the the ideas we throw her, and th that's great. And you know, and, and then you know, a Amy runs with it, and she's, uh, you know, that th that whole sequence is like filming a musical. You know, each time yeah. we came in there, it, and it gets better and better and more and more elaborate. I mean, the funniest one was the, the I mean, seeing just that Wizard of Oz moment very quickly in the background <laughs> is so funny to me, I, and it's yeah. so yeah. elaborate. Yeah. Tornado. And none of that, none of that is CGI. That was all done in the space. They had her house spinning That's around, insane. floating across the state. It was really amazing to be there on set while they did that. That was a, a great, yeah, we, had, we had just had a lot of fun. That was a really, you know, I, I think, I think like Tom said, it was just, it was an extra, um, an extra little bonus, you know, to, to add some authenticity because they could have, they could have just gone and used, you know, mm -hmm. source material. Um, but yeah. uh, instead, we we got to write some crazy for our part. inner stripper out. Yeah, <laughs> didn't know that when you were studying acting, you're going to be exactly <laughs> musically there, musically there's, stripping. There's on the stage. headline for your article. <laughs> yes, Miser Moore let their inner stripper out. Inner stripper <laughs> out. Okay. Um, well, that even just reminds me of like like circumstances of you know you're talking about theater school. I too was a I was a theater major and. Yeah. Uh, and it was, it just reminds me of, like, you guys would have to write something where instead of this beautiful grand orchestra that Shy Baldwin has, um, depending on who he kicks in and out of his band, but you have to think, <laughs> it makes me think automatically of, like, the instruments that are at the Wolford. Like, maybe you guys would even have to think of, like, what is there and how that's different from something else, how sort of like a uh, shoestring or ragtag that, that is. Yep, that's exactly what we had to do. In fact, the uh -huh. story that happens in the background is that while Maisel, while Midge is working at the at the Wolford, she's, you know, obviously whipping them into shape and making, making mm -hmm. the whole show better. So the band starts out really bad mm -hmm. and we intentionally have them play, you know, the players that, I mean, these players are the best players in New York, yeah. but so we, you know, you, it takes a good player to play badly sometimes. And it was, it was <laughs> hilarious. We had to have them play badly and yeah, it's, it's a very small band. I think it's like piano, guitar, clarinet, mm -hmm. violin, bass, and drums and trumpet, you know? So it's like, you know, and, and, and the fun of it, of course, is that we, we stay authentic to that until, until sort of farther down. Like by the time we get to Wizard of Oz, I mean, no spoilers, but we're using a, a bigger orchestra that's probably in the Wolford. Yeah, really. But that's part of the fun because at that point we've gone so over the top. You know, <laughs> the fun thing about Maisel is that you, you know, we've said this before, but you know, it's everything is always at 11 on that show. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, you know, it's the dialogue, everything's super authentic and super in 
character and super and period, except everything is turned to 11. And I think that's kind of what we what we strove toward in the, in the little backstory that we had of what was happening in the Wolford Orchestra. And some of that stuff, you know, so Tom and I did some of that stuff. And then David Chase, this amazing arranger, uh, he did some of the uh, arrangements for the songs that weren't original. Mm -hmm. And, you know, his stuff is just so dead on authentic and fun. He's amazing. Just it's the best team to work with. And, and actually, um, mm -hmm. to make it sound even authentic, we recorded a lot of those cues in that actual theater space. And uh -huh. what's, what's amazing to me is that that theater space is not a real theater. Like, I mean, it is, they built that set. That set is yeah. actually created on, on Stein, in Steiner Studios. And, you know, cause when I, the first time I walked on that set, I was like, wait a minute, th there's a backstage, a front stage, an orchestra pit, a bar, a lobby, a balcony. And it's uh, the only thing that it doesn't have is a ceiling. Cause they have the light grid <laughs> on top. But I was like, can we do, can we do our musical here? Cause this is like, you could sell tickets. I mean, it, it is an amazing space and it's, you know, it partly because COVID, I think they, they didn't want to actually go into it. I don't really know exactly the reason, but I'm assuming that might be one of the reasons, but it was, that set is just kudos to the whole I, team. I could not, when that set like rolls in and I was just like, where did they film that? And I was just like, <laughs> trying, but especially at the beginning of like when the season drops, there's not a lot of information about it out. So I couldn't find it. And then when like later I found out that they specifically designed it. Yep for the show and I was like but it's like the most beautifully distressed lived in theater that amazing and it and it feels that way when you're on it it feels incredible to be in that uh, space Bill Groom is a genius he's he, just you do walk in there and you feel like which old Broadway theater am I in you just yeah. have no like, like, is it the St. James I'm, like where are we <laughs> or even smaller am I at the box downtown like where yeah. did they film this is this out you know King's Theater in Brooklyn where are we it's, it's just amazing oh. okay. I wish we could take it with us and move it somewhere and open Maisel Live I if I were you guys I would have stolen at least like 12 things like every time I would walk on set I would like steal like a, a period hanger or something. Um, we, we have been very tempted, believe me. Okay. You guys are a lot more, you're a lot more well-behaved than I am. Um, <laughs> so I want to talk about maybe Monica, just because sort of like One Less Angel, you guys have an incredible knack for <laughs> having a song burrow into your brain, because <laughs> Even my husband, who who watches the show very casually, when I watch it, he knows he knows when Maisel is on to shut up because it's like one of my favorite shows. Um, I think that I caught him once or twice, like sort of mumbling. He didn't know the words or anything like that, but he was just sort of like humming the beat to it. And I was like, "Oh, you're singing a song from the Marvelous Mrs. Maisel, season four. Um, I want to know with. Calypso music. I didn't realize how much I love Calypso music. Do you guys have to do research on that? Like how, how is that out of your wheelhouse? Um, I don't know. I don't know. I just sort of. I'm just going to introduce my dog before we answer. This is, this is my Hi, dog. Bear. <gasps> oh my this God. is Bear. She's just going to wander around. I'm okay. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, we, you know, uh, it, it's, um, one of the things we do that we love to do is, you know, we, uh, when we get these assignments, uh, we'll start a playlist, uh, usually an Apple playlist or a Spotify playlist, and we'll just throw a big list of songs in there of, of you know, other Johnny Mathis and songs, or in, in this case, you know, any of the songs that we're looking for research in that kind of world, we'll mm -hmm. put we'll put them together in a big big swath. It won't just be that artist, you know. We you know we'll we'll put all different types of sounds in there, and we'll just start listening to that to keep it in our body because we don't want to write just a a, a pastiche you know we want to write something that right. is original and new for that moment but we don't want to you know we also don't want to rip off anything directly so we kind of put ourselves in there and listen to it so much that we're sort of you know it's coming out of our pores mm -hmm. and so yeah we listen to a lot of calypso and a lot of that stuff and you know his stuff is is amazing and that was one of the biggest challenge I, I think maybe monica was probably the hardest song we wrote this season tom don't you think most Absolutely. challenging well just look at our deleted file folder like we yeah. wrote so many different <laughs> versions of it and different songs before we even got to maybe monica probably the most drafts and the yeah. most versions. he certainly wrote both the most drafts and the most songs for that moment i think so yeah. i mean i think everybody probably knows this but you know for every song that we write 
for Maisel, we almost always have two other versions of songs that we've mm. written to get us into the in, into that spot. You know, and 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 sometimes it's even sometimes even more. Like there could be many many, you know. But but in in the case of of maybe Monica, I think I think we wrote maybe five or six songs, right? Oh, and know. then once we once we honed on maybe Monica, there's at least. 20 versions that we have. Our poor iTunes folder is just, is very, you never want to spend any time there. Well, you'll go insane. Um, was it always a, um, was it always a Harry Belafonte tribute from him to Shy? That was the, that was the big thing okay. that kind of tipped it over for us was that we always knew that Harry was singing at the wedding. And that's all okay. we, we just, we were told, Harry's going to sing a song at the wedding. God, no pressure. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like the most iconic singer, one of the most iconic figures of all time. Uh, and, you know, no problem. And we just couldn't crack it. Absolutely couldn't crack it. Yep. Everything, we, we wrote some good songs, but it just doesn't feel right. They should just use one of his songs, for goodness mm. sake. And then Amy called. I think she had seen some of our drafts and was like, okay, guys, I stopped thinking about it as a Harry song. It's a it's a wedding toast. It's a best man. It's Harry getting up and doing a toast mm -hmm. and making fun of Shy and Monica and having fun with them like, like a best man would do. And suddenly that was like, click. Oh, okay. This is, he and his band got together a couple mm -hmm. nights before and they wrote a song. They wrote a song in his style and playing with his instruments and all that kind of stuff and, and using some of his sort of techniques. But it got to have specific story to it, which ultimately we always get excited about story yeah exactly i think that's you you nailed it that's exactly what happened we just kind of needed to we needed that input to kind of get us away from the scary moment of like why are we writing? you know it's one thing when you're writing for a fictional character fictitious yeah. character things the word um you know for shy baldwin because that's uh you know we can write whatever we want because who knows who shy baldwin is right. but we all know who harry Belafonte is we know who he is we grew up listening to his music our parents listen to his music. so it's like you know coming up with something that that felt authentic to him once we realized it wasn't one of his hits it was a song he wrote specifically for this wedding you know that really let us have a lot of fun mm -hmm. and you know what was also fun about it is that we know shy's story um and the audience the, you know shy's story but nobody mm -hmm. there in in mazel land except for midge yeah, that was the real story. So we could we could write that in the song we wrote. You know, the song is a very authentic number that he would have perhaps written to sing to Shy. But then we as writers also can put a little bit in there about like, you know, how how did what kind happen? of how did this marriage happen, and you know what is actually going on here. And that was kind of a fun a fun added bonus for us as writers. When I, when I was watching the scene back recently, when I was you know prepping, I. I, I know the song is called Maybe Monica, but the word maybe kept sticking out. And then when I rewatched the scene again, um, I had forgotten that Leroy has the line when he's, um, I can't remember if it's before he sings City Lights or after, when um, he says like, oh, the word wife, that's such a weird word. And I was like, oh my God, there's so much subtext there. Like, I know, right? With that. Um, so even the word like maybe in the title and throughout the song, it's sort of, uh, <laughs> I feel like it takes on a, a, a different journey. It made me, it made me think of connecting that with um, the really think, emotional stuff that he has in season three. I think that, that that's, that we care a lot about Shy. Mm -hmm. We spent so much time thinking about him and working with Leroy and Darius, who is the singing voice. And so we can't help it when we look at that sequence to think of it, um, how painful it is what's happening. Yeah. yeah. And, and even though maybe Monica is a party song and fun, there is something like the whole episode is asking, how could this happen? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, how, why is he getting married? Why is he doing this? Why is she doing this? Why? And that song sort of voices the theme of the episode is, well, maybe she did this, maybe she did this, maybe this happened. Why did they get together? And we find out by the end that it's a business deal and it's a, you know, it's, it's locking him into this Faustian deal for the rest of his mm. life. But that, that's the kind of stuff that luckily with Maisel we're allowed to do is just to play with the story, to, to add layers hopefully that, look, we want you to just come away first and foremost 
to have as a party song. It's a party song out yeah. of the wedding that Harry's singing because he's been paid to and he's gonna have a great time teasing his friend. <laughs> but there's no reason why there can't be on a second watch or a third watch to think about like, oh, that's actually, that is actually what everyone's thinking in the room. Yeah. Maybe, maybe she was just the one who stuck around. Maybe she figured him out. Maybe she played with him. Maybe what, you know? There is this sort of um, something that I love about the song, especially with those rewatches that you just mentioned, because um, there is sort of the juxtaposition of the jauntiness of the song. Like anytime I listen to it, I literally do this. But it's also just like, if I think about it for three seconds, sort of the through line of that character that I feel is very cared for in, in this show. Um, there's a lot of sympathy that I think the viewer puts on for Shy because they know his story. Um, the sort of juxtaposition of seeing um, the scene between Leroy and Rachel in the bathroom later, or even when Rachel sees him outside by himself, that I feel like it only enhances the viewing even more and it makes you want to go back and just sort of see how, you know, the energy in the room when the song plays, it, may, it automatically to me makes me think of the emotional undercurrent to the whole thing. Um, Thank you. Yeah. That, I think that that is a testament to Leroy and the writing. Um, I think that, yeah, when you go back and watch it now, he, Shy is putting on a show at that wedding mm -hmm. and you can feel it. And there are little moments where it breaks through. I think during City Lights, our other song, when he talks about uh, Reggie having written it, there's mm -hmm. something there that's just a little sad, a little piece of shy breaks through, a little bit of that real person under there comes through. And I think that maybe Monica, you think about it, they probably choreographed a dance to it. Yeah, yeah. Ride. They knew this was coming. It, there's just, it, it's something that's a little, you know, it breaks your heart a little bit. And hopefully in that maze of way, we're laughing and dancing and it sneaks up on you and breaks your heart underneath. I think it takes something very skilled to sort of make you uh, <laughs> dance one second and be very wistful another yeah. moment. Um, it also is a, is a great reminder about how um, a lot of, because it is a period piece. Like I remember seeing a lot of people saying stuff like, um, you know, they should, the show should more directly, you know, not, um, I lost my words, sort of like uh, talk about the like real world implications of what the circumstances are. And I was like, that's not really what the show is. The show is sort of like a, a beautiful time capsule fantasy. Um, I'm just rambling now and just, I don't, yeah. I don't really no, know. I get where you're going though, but I think it is all that. And I think that the expectation that you can't put a, you can't put a 2022 lens on the characters, what they're mm -hmm. thinking you have, you have to remember that what Midge is, Gonna do is what Midge is gonna do in 1960, and she's she is not perfect. That's the thing. That's the people thing. want her to be perfect, but she, she is a flawed person. And I I I I've heard Amy talk about it that way, like and Rachel particularly talks about mm -hmm. like I, this is an imperfect woman, and that's why it's interesting to watch her because she yep. does make big mistakes, big mistakes and doesn't learn over from her. and over again. <laughs> You know, and it's, 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 that's what makes the show cool. And, and we can play a little support part. That's amazing that we can just sort of help pass that ball down the field. I just made a sports reference. Look at that. <gasps> I passed the ball down the field. Um, you? You know, what sport? Were, what sport, uh, Tom? What field? Well, what? that could be soccer or that could be football that, that I was referring to. It could oh. be either one. Yeah. So that was such confidence. I, I did. Sports family. Thanks, Sports. Dad. Mom. Um, anyway, uh, you were okay. saying. <laughs> I, was, I wasn't saying anything, really. No, you, you, you brought thankfully... sports up, Tom. That was the end yeah. of that. that oh, yeah. Just brought it all down. That's the new headline. Miser and Moore want to adapt, let's see, like any given Sunday, the musical. Yeah. <laughs> I think it lights the musical. <laughs> that would actually be a lot better. I don't want to say any given Sunday. <laughs> um. I sort of been wanted to ask, and we, we sort of have talked about it a, a little bit, but I, I even wanted to know, like, the City Lights comes, like, very close to maybe Monica. I was so delighted. I was like, oh, we get so much music in this episode. Um, was that even another added pressure, considering that it was, like, shy Baldwin, fake person, 
like uh, not a song that exists in the real world in the real world. And then you have Harry Belafonte, real person, again, not another song that exists in the real world. Um, is that like another sort of added pressure to creating like the authenticity that we sort of started talking about? Yeah, I, I, it definitely was pressure because, well, it, I, I'm, it's not, not, listen, the whole thing is pressure. <laughs> the, the minute we start, it's like pressure. But like, I think in the in the series, in that, you know, just what, it, it, Tom, correct if I'm wrong, but but um, we worked on Shy's number first um, and because we hadn't cracked what was happening and they didn't even know, I'm not even sure, we knew we had to write a Shy Ball with number first wedding. We didn't know about Harry Belafonte right at first, I think. So we were already writing that song earlier. And that song, when, when that song got, approved um uh you know we, that song was locked in and that then made the stuff we wrote for Harry, Harry Belafonte uh, more of a challenge because we couldn't just go anywhere we it had to complement what we had just done with that you know and, that, and I and not tell, and not feel the same not, it didn't want to feel the same exactly mm-hmm. and, and even though we were going to write a calypso kind of it's still we didn't want it you know we have our tricks and our thing. We had to just make sure we weren't going, you know, keys and melodic phrases and lyric ideas. We, we had to stay away from that, that kind of moment, you know? And to that, you know the, the, again, authenticity and people believing is, is our highest bar. Like that we have to do yeah. and people have to do that. And so this, this year we got the greatest compliment and Robin, the, uh, Robin Erdang, the amazing and Emmy nominated music supervisor mm-hmm. told us uh, recently, that she got an email from the representative of Harry Belafonte's uh, music catalog. Mm-hmm. And this person was like, hey, we know you used a uh, Harry song. Um, we'd love for you to use some of his other songs because we don't actually represent that song for some reason. We don't know why. And she had to write it back. Um, it's because y- it's not a Harry Belafonte song. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh my God. You no, know, his own like, whoever is the licensor of his material was kind of mad. It was like, they found the one song that's not really him. <laughs> and, right. and, uh, you know. The one song, oh they, they the found the one song we don't own. That we didn't represent, right. yeah, exactly. <laughs> They're like, ah, we lost out on the money. That's the one song we don't own. Oh my God, that has been like a huge compliment. Oh it was. It was. Really was. Compliment. Those funny stories really make you go like, okay, hopefully we're kind of doing it right. You know, we're trying to keep it authentic and we're not trying to, put ourselves in this too much. We're trying to really make it feel of, of, of the moment and of that world. Yeah. Ah, uh, uh, okay. You know, and also, by the way, I just have to say that I can just see Amy Sherman Palladino just walking over to you after she tells you you need a wedding song for Shy Baldwin's wedding. And then she just like says, oh, and by the way, it's Harry Belafonte. And then she just walks away. Like, exactly. I just imagine. It, it's pretty much like that. Except it's usually by text message. It's yeah. usually like we'll get a random text that's just like, "Hey, can you can you write a Harry Belafonte song?" Like, wait, wait, what, 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 wait, 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 wait. Hello, like Harry, Hello? Harry Belafonte. Harry Belafonte. <laughs> back up, back up. Um, yeah, oh. it's it's always she likes to do the little side drop out of nowhere. I love it. Yeah. And we love wait, it. Wait, wait till the next season. You'll oh, understand when we, when we roll our eyes at like the drops that she does. There's a killer next season. You yes. can't say anymore. Yes, but lots of okay. fun. I did want to ask about the uh, the bad Broadway song, bad Broadway song. <laughs> I was going to ask you like what you guys would consider an actual bad Broadway song, but I don't want to. I don't want to throw any negativity out there. But I mean, that has. I think you know, like when you see an actor playing a bad actor, that is so much harder than you think it is. What sort of rules do you have to throw out the window in order to make it bad? I'm using a lot of air quotes, I'm sorry. Yeah. Well, go, Tom. I was, <laughs> I was just gonna start to say, I, you know, it, a, a bad music a lot of times, is hardly ever because of the songs. Um, mm-hmm. It's almost always because the story, you know what I mean? A lot of times, let's be honest. I mean, there, there's, a, um, there's a lot of shows I can think of that have great scores, but are bad shows because they don't have a great story or the book doesn't work. It, it's very rare that there's an amazing book, but the show is terrible because the songs are bad. Like that's the yeah, that's think true. of one, <laughs> but I'm not gonna say. Uh, okay. yes. But anyway, so that being said, like, you know, and, and we did, you know, we, the assignment was to write the one good song from the rest of the bad musical. So to, like to write it, you know, and, and we just kind of imagined that they had written one, one song that was hooky, mm-hmm. 
and then just repeated it 37 times in the show. So there's like 47 reprises of this song. And within the song itself, we were just like, we're going to sing the hook 150 times. And also we did that because we had no idea how much of it's going to be on screen. And it turns out not very much. You know I mean, they only use a very small part of that song. Yeah. But the hook's there, which is good. Um, and so that was kind of, you know, we started off from that place. And, I, you know, it's, it is funny to think about this because it's the character that they met in season two, who is mm-hmm. actually a good friend of ours, that actor is, is a friend of ours. And so, just, you know, he plays this character that's, that's been spending his summers at the Catskills and has just been parceling that information away to write, to write his own sort of, you know, Rodgers and Hammerstein-esque musical. Um, and, uh, and, you know, again, we... <laughs> We wrote about five songs from that musical. We, of which could year. Whole, we could do like the first act of the musical. We, if you we really could. To. And, do it right uh, now. And we will. We could whip them out. And, and um, you know, which is just part of our process a little bit. And, um, and yeah, maybe we will. We'll have to do a cabaret sometime, Tom, of like yeah. that, <gasps> that musical. That musical and Smash musical. We'll do them together. Yeah. Uh, the, I think I will say the one like, the one trick I kept in mind, even though it's, it's supposed to be a decent song in the show, you're supposed to, like you definitely don't want to feel like it's the best thing in the world. It's just it's a good song. Uh-huh. Um, but I kept what I kept thinking was, what would I have done in college if I were writing this? That's like before, <laughs> before I had lots okay. of experience, I had a lot of like confidence, but not the craft or whatever right. craft I may have now. Um, still a lot to learn, but the you know. So I would think now I wouldn't do that third rhyme, that bad rhyme. But in this song. I'm gonna put that third, like make it rhyme like three times. <laughs> you know, those things to show off. That's that to uh, me is like, like when you're when you're like 20 and you're like, this is really clever. I'm gonna put it in there. Exactly. So that therefore I rhymed danced with fianced. Would I do that now? No. <laughs> Why not? We did do it now though. That's the best that's part true. of it. That's the best part. But, <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like my college self would have gone, yes. yes. <laughs> Um, there was there is a part of the show where I think it's like I'm probably misremembering this, but like the camera is like going through the lobby and like someone's like walking out of the house and the door is closing and you can hear the music. And I remember like the first or second time that I watched, I was like, no, 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 go back. I want to hear, I want to see the playing. show. Just it's because... playing under the whole thing, under the whole that whole uh, scene. You well, can we had insert. done, and, and also we had actually, you know, again, we we get, it was a text message was like, you have to write the one good song from a bad musical. And then we're also going to do this musical. Off this is gonna be, and we're like, okay. So we started working on it. We had no, we only had the title of the musical. They came, they danced. And so Tom and I just started, I mean, Tom basically wrote an entire outline of what this musical <sighs> was. And then we picked like five moments and we wrote songs for those moments. And then we actually, originally there was going to be a, there was going to be a really a much longer visual sequence coming into the theater mm-hmm. which is the king's theater in brooklyn by the way that that where that is filmed okay. and and we were gonna so we had actually taken all those extra songs and put them in an overture that played underneath this whole sequence moving into the theater but they ended up cutting it cutting all of that out so we it, and they used um overture to pipe dream i think there was um, a lot more cape action from there was a lot of cape action i know people are gonna be really disappointed there's a lot of cape on the cutting room floor so it was was that was that whole overture seat was that filmed no, um, oh, okay. yes. yes 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 it was it just it, it was, was edited down quite a bit it cut um, i i randomly thought today um i was like what happens after the final season is over and i'm not sure if they do release like you know entire series of anything anymore but i was just like because i, I was in a bookstore yesterday and i saw the the book about the costumes and I was just like oh all the stuff that's going to come out like post Maisel of the crafts of everything it was like they're going to have it was like there's going to be a box set and there's going to be a million outtakes and there's going to be a million scenes and everything's going to be beautiful in it everything's going to sound would, beautiful there's so much fun stuff like I mean you know they they filmed you know things for us like they filmed all of maybe Monica and there's a whole percussion break that you know just it's on the cutting room floor you don't need to spend any more time there but you know I'd love to see that <laughs> I was yeah. there the day they shot it I was like let's see this yeah. I'm sure every the people love it. I mean, there's so many, there's so many good little gems that I mean, but that's you know, that's part of what what makes it so special is they mm-hmm. they know to you know too much of a good thing. They just keep they just keep it so tight. The editors on the show are just so amazing. Yeah. Um, and then our uh, this the, the the woman who does the music editing too. She's just Annette genius. Kudrick. Annette Kudrick is is 
Annette is, is she just can make, she'll, she'll, she takes all, she's there in the studio with us as we're recording. And we'll talk to each other about setting up places for her to get cuts and changes and how she mm. can, you know, take certain parts of this instrument. And, you know, she takes all the orchestrations as we do them and then has them at her disposal when they do make these kind of cuts so she can make it all seamless and work in the background. It's pretty amazing. It's a great team. Mm. 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 But yes, push for that, push for yeah. that box set. That's for the album, cool. like the box set of all the cut songs and all the the, yeah. the other versions of songs we would- The do. videos of you guys performing the entire They Came, They Danced. Um, it's happening well, nightly. We've got many, many demos of us doing all of those too. I'm glad there was a lot more cave action because when I interviewed, I, I had the fortune of talking to Tony and I'll say this last thing before I let you guys go. Um, I almost did not ask him um, about the cape because I thought the cape was so much fun. And he told me that like no one asked him about like the rehearsal process that he had to have with twirling a cape. And that was one of my favorite things of the whole last, of the whole season. So now that I know, he was like, I had to come in with yeah. the rehearsal to do it. And I was like, that's the greatest thing I've ever heard of in my life. That's very like theater camp-esque in a, in a way. As I recall, um, there was a moment of him lifting the cape out of the box first. Yeah. Like he got it and that, that got cut. So oh, he had God. to do some serious cape work. Yeah. Oh, that's right. The whole sequence started in the apartment and then- the apartment the whole... Yes. Cape. Cut box scenes. Set. Telling you box set. Box yeah. set. <laughs> And annoy everyone at Amazon. Um, well, thank you guys so much for your time. I'm so in love with uh, the music to the point of probably obnoxious obsessions. So thank you so much for, <laughs> for taking the time to talk to me. Thank you. We um, always love to come on. Yeah, I'm a uh, huge fan. We talk to you next year because there's this. Yeah. I know. Next you year. Are gonna, you're, you're just here. It's very funny. Get yourself ready. Okay.